Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the latest Knight's Landing new user training. This is the last KNL training that we will do before the KNL nodes go live, before we start charging on Cori. So hopefully by then you all will be familiar with the architecture and the hardware and software and how to get your codes running well. Uh, so for those of you following along at home, the Knights nodes were installed in Cori towards the later end of last year. They've been in sort of a pre-production phase for since then, so not quite a year. Um, that phase consisted of uh, no charge for users who were enabled for those nodes, um, relatively limited access until recently, so all NERSC users should be able to use um, the KNL nodes now. There was some intermittent downtime because we were making sure the hardware was stable and doing some software upgrades and so on. And um, so when it enters production, some of that will change. Uh, we'll start charging. So the charge factors, I believe, are already listed on the NERSC website. If memory serves, I believe it's 96 NERSC hours per KNL node hour, which is a little bit more than the Haswell nodes. And hopefully there will be fewer downtimes, more stable software environment, and everyone will be running well. So, KNL, formerly called Xeon Phi, KNL is a code name that Intel used until they released it. KNL is a second generation of the Xeon Phi architecture from Intel. Um, unlike Knight's Corner, which some of you may have used, it's a self-hosted architecture. So the operating system runs directly on the Knight's hardware. Um, there are significant improvements in both scalar and vector performance over Knight's Corner. Um, there's this new on-package high bandwidth memory. Um, this last point, the fabric on-package, is actually not relevant to Cori. Uh, we don't use Intel's fabric, we use Craze. So you could ignore that last point. Um, Intel does release three pro versions of Knight's Landing. We are the one on the far left, KNL self-boot. Uh, the other two are, are part of other systems at other labs. Um, but that's not what we have, so. Uh, this is a sort of a simplified diagram of what the Knight's uh, chip looks like. So Knight's corner was a ring. The cores were connected in a ring. Knight's landing is connected in a 2D mesh. Um, you can see the little, the MCD RAM is the on-package high bandwidth memory. So there are, I believe, eight channels of MCD RAM, uh, six channels of DDR4. And the part that we have, so this diagram says, uh, th yeah, yes, 36 tiles, which is 72 cores. A tile is two cores, and that's the part that we have. No, sorry, we have 68 cores, so we have 34 tiles, sorry. Um, and it has significantly higher uh, peak double precision and single precision floating point performance over both KNC and over Haswell nodes. Um, this slide claims three teraflops. Uh, in reality, you'll probably see a little bit less than that. And unlike Haswell, which is a two-socket system, at least the version we have on Cori, uh, the Knight's nodes are one socket each. And so there's 16 gigabytes of this high bandwidth memory, which can reach somewhere around 400 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, compared to about 100 of the DDR4. So there's a lot more of the DDR4. We have 96 gigabytes on this part. Um, and only 16 gigabytes of the MCD RAM. So, again, the KNL chip is built out of tiles. Tiles are a pair of cores which are on a single piece of hardware. Um, each core has an L1 cache, and then they sh each tile shares an L2 cache of one megabyte. Um, it supports up to four hardware threads uh, per core, whereas Haswell only supports two. Um, the instruction set is twice as wide on Knight's Landing as it is on Haswell, so Haswell supported up to AVX2 instructions, which are 256-bit. KNL supports AVX512, which as the name suggests is 512-bit. Um, but an important thing to keep in mind is that Intel giveth and they rarely taketh away when it comes to instruction sets, so anything that was compiled on several generations prior, prior to Knight's Landing will still run on Knight's Landing without recompiling. So for example, you would not have to recompile Emacs or Vim to run on Knight's Landing, which is nice. Um, 
Is there anything else? So the cache is coherent across the whole, uh, across the whole chip. And that's about all there is to say on this slide. Are there questions on the chat yet? Okay. So again, some of this is a review. Um, and I don't think there's anything new. Again, this last point is not uh, true about Cori. We do not have an integrated fabric, or we do not have the Omnipath fabric on KNL. So this is a comparison of Cori, the Knight's landing nodes on Cori versus Edison, which uses the Ivy Bridge Xeon architecture. Edison's are older of the two uh, crays that we have in production right now. So this just gives you an idea of how things have changed at a very high level and things that users will need to be aware of when they're migrating from Edison to Cori, and particularly the Knight's Landing nodes on Cori. So you can see that the node count has almost doubled. Uh, we're at just under 10,000 nodes of Knight's Landing, along with 2,388 nodes of Haswell. So in sum, Cori has around 12,000 nodes total. Uh, the core count has gone up significantly. So Edison, the Ivy Bridge architecture is a dual socket architecture. So there's 24 cores per node on Edison, 12 cores per socket. But Cori has, the Knight's Landing has a single socket and 68 cores. Um, Edison also, support, the Ivy Bridge nodes also support uh, two hyperthreads per core. Knight's Landing supports four, so the number of hyperthreads that are active per node has gone up from 24 times two, which is 48, up to 272. So the amount of hyperthreads that you can keep running in total has gone up a lot. Um, so that's all good. Larger numbers are usually better. However, there are important things to keep in mind, such as the clock speed, which has gone down by about a factor of two. So Edison sort of fluctuates around two and a half gigahertz. Um, the Knight's Landing in Haswell is about 2.3 gigahertz. Knight's Landing is about half of that. It's between about 1.2 and 1.4. So the clock speed has gone down quite a bit, which means that in order to get performance, we have to find that performance elsewhere. And the way we find it is usually through more parallelism. So we don't find it just through clock speeds anymore. Um, and you can see that here, we can actually retire significantly more in operations per cycle on Cori than we can on Edison. And so this is one way that you, that you can get better performance on Cori even while uh, dealing with, with significantly slower clock speeds. Um, like I said before, Edis so Edison only had one type of memory, which I believe is DDR3, uh, 64 gigabytes per node, which comes out to about 2.5 gigabytes per core. Cori has two types of memory, so the memory hierarchy is a little bit more complicated now. It has 16 gigabytes of this on package, this MCD RAM, with about 400 gigabytes per second, and then 96 gigabytes of DDR4, which is 112 total. So if you're in cache mode, if you're running in cache mode, which is a memory mode that you can run in, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that's 112 gigabytes total of memory per node that you have available, which comes out to something like 1.6 gigabytes per core. If you're running in flat mode and you just want to use the high bandwidth memory exclusively, it's much lower, it's about 230 megabytes per core. So the memory per core, no matter how you look at it, has gone down quite a bit in comparison to Edison. Um, but the memory bandwidths have gone up. So DDR4 is a little bit faster than DDR3, um, but the MCD RAM is significantly faster, about a factor, up to a factor of four. So again, this is a, the, in, in terms of the instructions that you can issue on a KNL node, you can see the two columns on the left show the Sandy Bridge and the Haswell are, uh, instructions. So Sandy Bridge, I believe, yeah, Sandy Bridge has, supports up to AVX, which is 128-bit. Uh, Haswell supports 256-bit via AVX2. And then KNL supports AVX512, which is 512-bit. So the instruction, the, the, the vector widths are getting wider. So that's another way that you can find more parallelism in your application. And there are two of these vector processing units per core on KNL. So besides the core counts going up, the vector widths per core have also gone up. And again, Intel has not taken anything away in terms of instructions. So anything that you compiled 
on Haswell or even on Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge will still run on KNL. It may not run well, it may not run as, as well as it can because it won't have these, five, these AVX 512 instructions, but it will run. So for some applications which don't depend very significantly on performance, for example, Vim or Emacs, you probably won't need to recompile those. So, and this was not true with regard to Knight's Corner. Knight's Corner actually was um, a different instruction set and you had to recompile everything for it. So, I mentioned memory modes in the last slide. So, KNL also has a new feature which is configurable memory modes. This was not available on Haswell or on Ivy Bridge. And what I mean by memory modes is you can actually decide how you want the high bandwidth memory, this MCD RAM, and the DDR to interact with each other. So the first mode, which is conceptually the simplest in terms of writing code to use it, is called cache mode. And as the name suggests, this treats the MCD RAM as a transparent cache. So it's not a separately addressable piece of memory that you can allocate and that you can allocate memory to. It's totally transparent to you. So, it's, while Knight's Landing does not have an L3 cache like Haswell does, you can sort of emulate an L3 cache using MCD-RAM in this way. It's not as fast, the latency for MCD-RAM is not as fast as, an, as a true L3 cache, but it's definitely better than nothing. Um, so again, if you run in cache mode, your application will transparently use MCD-RAM when it can, um, which is nice because you don't have to explicitly address DDR RAM, DDR memory versus uh, MCD RAM. Um, there are some potential downsides to using cache mode, which I believe are on the next slide, but that is one mode that's available to you. And, and so in, uh, from a practical perspective, when you're running jobs in your Slurm script, in the little stanza at the top when you're choosing the partition and the time limit and so on, there's actually a mode, there's a, you can specify, in fact, you must specify a constraint when you're running on a night's, when you're requesting night's landing uh, nodes, you actually have to tell it what memory mode that you want. If, and in fact, if you don't, it will just give you something and you'll find out at runtime what you got. So another mode uh, that you can use is called flat mode. And in this case, the MCD RAM is actually configured as a separate NUMA domain. So now it, you're, when you ask the hardware, what memory do you have available? It will tell you, I have two banks of memory. I have 96 gigabytes of this and 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. Uh, flat mode, in terms of performance, can do better than cache mode. The downside is that it's a little bit more complicated to use. Um, either you need to have an application which has a fairly small memory footprint, because 16 gigabytes is not very much, or you have to explicitly address memory. And there are tools for doing that, but you'll have to write in your application uh, specific uh, uh, malloc and free statements that say use MCD RAM or use DDR. So it's a little more complicated, but you can get faster performance. And then a third option is hybrid mode where you can actually choose a little bit of both. You can, you can decide to have a little bit of memory in flat mode and then a little bit in cache mode. This is not a particularly popular model. In fact, I personally have never used it before. Um, it's quite a bit to manage. And so generally users will prefer either pure cache mode or pure flat mode. And so you can choose either, you can choose any of these modes that you want it, when you run your job. Um, the downside is that these have to be configured at boot time. So if a node in the mode that you request is not available, Slurm will actually have to reboot the node. And that is, I forget what the actual time that it takes these days is, but you can expect 20 minutes to half an hour. So it's, it's not short. Okay. So this is um, a little bit more about what I just said. This shows how the memory expresses its, exposes itself in terms of NUMA domains when you're running in flat mode versus cache mode. So on the left, this is what the memory looks like in, uh, uh, let's see if I can get this right. So yeah, so on the left is KNL. Uh, this is in flat mode, so you'll actually see a separate NUMA domain with 16 gigabytes of MCD RAM and another NUMA domain that has the DDR. Um, it, in contrast, on Ivy Bridge or on Haswell, you will always see two NUMA domains. You can't choose to have just one because there are two physical sockets. 
So uh, the general use case for running in flat mode, if, you're, if you need to allocate memory explicitly into the high bandwidth memory, generally you want to choose the memory that will be used most often in your application. Um, so that the bandwidth, because there's not much storage available, it's only 16 gigabytes, um, you want to devote that storage, the limited storage to, uh, to memory which needs to, be, which needs to have very high bandwidth so you can get good performance. So there are two ways to explicitly allocate memory into uh, high bandwidth memory. Um, one is through this memkind library which we already have on Cori, uh, and there's a little description of the API on the next slide, I believe. So if you're writing C or C++ applications, this, is gen this, this uh, memkind library is generally what you will use. The other option, if you're writing Fortran codes and you need to allocate memory into MCD-RAM, um, is to use a FastMem directive, which is an Intel compiler directive. Um, it's not part of the Fortran standard. It is an Intel-specific directive. Um, but that option is available to you as well. So this is what... On the left, this is what Memkind, the Memkind API looks like. So Memkind itself is on GitHub. You can go get it if you want. We do support it as a module on Cori. I don't remember if it's called Memkind or Cray Memkind. Cray or Cray Memkind. Um, but that module is available for you to use. So you have to include a, I believe there's a, there's a, a header file that you need to include, which is probably memkind.h. Um, and then in terms of what code you need to change, so if you're using malloc's and freeze, like in C code, all you need to do is you change your malloc to HBW malloc. And so HBW malloc will explicitly allocate memory into high bandwidth memory. Um, I don't believe there are corresponding new and free statements. If you use new and free in C++, I don't believe that memkind supports new, or sorry, new and delete. Um, but someone please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, this, this is Chris Contalupo here. Uh, it does actually uh, support new and delete. Oh, it does? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, not actually expressly new and delete, but if you have any STL containers, there's a standard indicator uh, that it provides that you can use a standard uh, standard. <coughs> OK. Well, thank you for the clarification. Sure. So that is Memkind on the left. And then on the right, if you're writing Fortran uh, applications and you need to explicitly allocate high bandwidth memory, um, there's this FastMem directive, which is shown in red. So uh, this DEC is, a, is an Intel-specific directive. So again, this is if you compile with the Cray compiler or with GNU, they won't know what to do with this flag, and I think they'll actually ignore it entirely. Um, but you just, uh, you just append this FastMem uh, uh, stanza to the array or the memory that you're going to allocate already. I believe FastMem only works with allocatable arrays. And I believe that's true. So uh, if you just have, for example, real A8, if you have a stack array, I don't believe FastMem will work. It, it requires allocatable, the allocatable attribute. So that's one caveat to using FastMem. OK, so I think Brandon will take over for the rest of this. Are there other questions before we transition? Is anyone looking at the chat? Oh, it would show up here. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So the, the the comment from the audience was just pointing out that there is um, that there are memkind modules available at NERSC for um, um, so module avail memkind will show you the options. Um, okay. So thanks, Brian, for the introduction for the architecture. Um, I'm just going to describe in a little bit more detail some of the other architectural options in KNL. Um, so in addition to the memory modes, there's, um, there's also uh, a unique feature of KNL is this distributed uh, L2 cache architecture. Um, so as Brian mentioned earlier, each core has its own individual L2, but these are coherent. Um, and this is a, a block diagram um, showing the, the, interconnection, the connection between the different tiles. And, um, and then every row and column in this architecture is a half-filled ring. Um, 
the, I guess the exact layout of this architecture isn't necessarily um, important for your application, but um, the characteristics are a little bit different than a, um, a completely unified L3, for example. Um, and with such an architecture, there's a number of different ways that you can um, configure the chip to, to be exposed to the, the user space. So the, the most common mode and also the, the default in almost every application uh, is quadrant mode. So in quadrant mode, the, the Xeon Phi chip is exposed as a single NUMA domain, but internally it's divided into four virtual quadrants. And what these virtual quadrants mean is that the, the memory addresses are hashed to a directory that's a distributed directory in the, the cache hierarchy. Are, um, they're addressed to the, the same quadrant as the core that it comes from. So what this means is that you get some benefit of, um, of locality when you try to access some memory that's local to your quadrant. Um, and in general, this is, this is probably the easiest mode to use in terms of uh, performance to ease of use trade-off. You only have to worry about one NUMA domain. You don't have to explicitly manage your locality. Um, and you get a, a bandwidth benefit um, versus having an all-to-all -all mode where there's no affinity between um, uh, between the address and the directory. And I guess I could describe, so the, in this block diagram, it shows what happens when um, at uh, a core on t this tile with a labeled one um, goes to access uh, some memory address that it doesn't own. So the, the request travels um, across the mesh to, um, to a directory that tells which MCD RAM controller to look to request the memory data from. And then that gets sent back across the, um, the on-chip mesh to the tile. Um, so what, what Quadrant does is kind of limits the, um, the affinity between where the the directory is located and where the actual memory is. Um, so another way to configure this chip is uh, through the subnuma clustering modes. So there's there's actually two different sub sub SNC modes. You can either divide the chip in half, or you can d divide the chip into quadrants. Um, and in this case, that division is exposed to the operating system and the user. So if you choose SNC2 mode, then it, the chip appears as two, um, two separate NUMA domains. So that'll be familiar to anyone who's used um, dual socket Xeon nodes on Edison or the Haswell partition on Cori. Um, so in principle, uh, these modes provide um, even lower latency for memory accesses. Um, but the trade-off is you have to explicitly um, you have to explicitly program and manage, and it also um, makes your can complicate your job launch scripts, especially because um, in SNC four. Uh, 68 isn't an even multiple of four. Um, so you have to be very careful to, to distribute um, your MPI ranks, your processes um, evenly across uh, four uh, quadrants that have different numbers of cores. And just to keep it self-contained, I'll go over again the, uh, the memory modes. Um, so in general, the, the standard advice is to just stick with Quadrant, um, and certainly worth checking the other modes, but uh, 
quadrant is by far the easiest and in pretty much every case I've seen gives um, very close to optimal performance compared to the others. Um, so yeah, as Brian mentioned earlier, there's a number of ways you can configure the memory, the on-package memory uh, in the Xeon Phi. Um, so in, in cache mode, it's the easiest to use. Uh, the user doesn't see any, dif any different memory domains. The 16 gigabytes of on-package memory act as a transparent cache. Um, However, in this case, if you are using lots of memory and you have a cache miss, then you're getting uh, a latency penalty because you've gone to the MCD RAM and now you need to go to the DDR. Um, in flat mode, uh, it's exposed as a separate NUMA domain that just contains the memory. Um, and that can be, you can place your allocations there through um, NUMA control, uh, NUMA control or minus minus hardware or LSCPU can give you all the details of um, the exact hardware configuration that you have. Um, and then hybrid is a is a mode that I yeah I guess as Brian said I don't think many people have um, have used. Um, but it's a it's a a combination of the of cache and flat mode. So just the the main choice is usually between cache and flat, um, and both have their upsides and downs. So in cache mode, uh, the benefit is that it it kind of works out of the box. You don't have to change your code or um, invoke any fancy um, or any changes to your run scripts. Um, and you do get a significant <laughs> bandwidth benefit over um, running out of just the DDR. Um, the downside is that the, the peak bandwidth you can get is a little bit, is about, I think, 95% or so of the, the peak bandwidth um, that you can obtain in flat mode. And you have a slight latency penalty. Um, and you also lose 16 gigabytes of addressable memory. Um, so if you're really trying to use as much memory as possible on a node, um, this mode will take some of that away from you. Uh, in flat mode is the, the most performant choice. If you're running, if your application is using less than 16 gigabytes, so if you know for sure that you're only using, you know, 10 gigabytes per node, um, then you can run entirely out of MCD RAM um, and get the maximum performance possible. And the the downside is is that if you are using more than 16 gigabytes your application will need to be modified somehow to exploit this. Otherwise, you'll run only out of the, um, the DDR and get significantly lower performance. And yeah, I guess this is the, the final, one of the final bullet points is um, then you have the, also the headache of choosing what gets allocated. If, you, um, if you're going to selectively allocate, uh, it can be quite a, a problem to figure out exactly which arrays should or shouldn't be put into MCD RAM. Um, so just a few more details about uh, actually using the flat mode MCD RAM. Um, so if your whole application can fit 16 gigabytes, you can just add NUMA control. Uh, you can use NUMA control to bind the memory allocations to a specific NUMA domain. Um, option B is using libraries like the ones that, uh, like Memkind that Brian talked about earlier. Um, and Memkind can enable some compiler directives for Fortran, or you have to rewrite your, your malloc and freeze, or I guess just your malloc's in, um, 
in C code. Then there's, there's also this option of auto HBW, which is, uh, is based on memkind. And what this one does is, depending on the size of the malloc, which you can control, um, you, can, uh, you can do a kind of coarse grained, you know, if this array is bigger than a megabyte, put it in MCD RAM. If it's less, just leave it in DDR. So it allows that sort of option. And then the, the final option, which is um, generally not recommended, but you can, in principle, use direct um, Linux system calls, like mmap or an mbind, um, to explicitly uh, to kind of bypass um, these library options. But um, th this. Uh, has a couple of drawbacks, and you have to do a lot of work yourself to um, to efficiently use it. And so, just the details of uh, how that works. Um, so the MCD RAM is a different NUMA node. So, so the node zero, for example, would contain all of your CPU cores and the DDR, and NUMA node one would have just the MCD RAM. Um, so the way you can control that is with uh, NUMA control. Um, and really the best thing is to use the, to read the man pages for the exact syntax. Um, but the most useful commands are NUMA control minus minus hardware, which shows you what you have. And then NUMA control minus minus membind equals, um, which tells which NUMA node to bind your memory to. Then there's, there's also th these preferred and interleave options. Um, and th those, um, those allow, so preferred, those allow you some control over letting your, if your memory allocations might go over 16 gigabytes, instead of just running out of memory, um, they could spill over to the DDR. So option B, just again, um, for C, you just switch malloc, you add an include, um, and add HBW to your mallocs. Um, and for the Intel compilers, um, you can, if you have allocatable arrays, you can add an attribute, um, a fast mem attribute to those arrays, and they'll be allocated in the MCD RAM. So uh, auto HBW um, is built on memkind. And what you just have to do in this case is um, you set some threshold for, for the size that you want to, um, to split your memory allocations on between the different NUMA domains. And so what if you want to combine SNC modes with flat mode? Um, then you could have up to eight NUMA domains to deal with. Um, so it, it, your launch command can be quite complex. But uh, for one, for, for single MPI ranks, you can use NUMA control and then specify a comma-separated list of uh, NUMA domains that memory allocations should be in. Um, and again, NUMA control minus capital H tells you um, about the actual hardware layout that you're looking at. And to see how all this is working, um, with your application running, you can use NUMA stat minus M, uh, which will show the memory usage in each NUMA domain. Um, and then there's also kind of standard Linux um, sys and proc paths, which uh, expose this information as well. Um, 
Yeah. And just in case you, for some reason, uh, would like to experiment more and you have uh, access to a dual socket system like Edison, you can, you can get some idea on your own of, um, of using the different, uh, or using kind of remote memory affinity. Um, so in this case, what you would do is you would, um, you would bind your memory to the, you bind your allocations to a different socket in your system. Um, although I guess now that KNL is open to everyone, um, this is kind of an approximation and it's probably better to, to actually test on the, the real system. And I guess at this point, we'd just like to kind of open it up to if there's any questions about the architecture. Can I ask questions in the comments or in, I mean, in the chat, or um, if you want to actually ask a question, that's fine too. I have a question. So uh, you mentioned in passing there was huge page uh, support. What's that like for MCD RAM? Is still only pages available? Or um, you repeat the question. Yeah. So so the question was uh, was is there a huge page support for MCD RAM? And yes, uh, it works the same way. Um, I think it, at one point there there is a bug with this. There was a bug with a specific size of huge page in MCD RAM, but I think that's solved at this point. But uh, yeah, you can just compile with the Cray, PE, huge pages, whatever um, module, and then use your application as, as normal. Yeah. And uh, Okay, so, so uh, a question from the chat is what, what is the default memory mode? Will parts of KNL be booted in flat mode? And who pays for the lengthy reboot time? Um, well, I guess that's three questions. But uh, so the, the default mode is quad cache. Um, our system allows for reboots. Um, so there's, there's not there's not nodes that are specifically dedicated to flat mode, for example. Um, and then paying for the reboot time, um, I, I think maybe I'll, uh, yeah, so the, the, yeah, so, yeah. So, so by, by default, we, um, we set a parameter to uh, delay the reboot as much as possible. I think default parameter is two days. And if there's, uh, but sometimes if there is current, uh, there are such uh, type of nodes available, you don't have to wait. That's the maximum wait time you want to avoid the uh, charging for reboot. Okay, so the so the user does get charged for the thirty minute reboot. The recent update, they they said twenty one minutes and something. Like that. Only, only 21 minutes now, y'all. Yeah, only 21 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the scheduler will try to avoid rebooting if it has to. Yeah. 